Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a question. As long as U.S. support continues, is there anything that can stop Israel's highly destructive assault on Gaza from just going on indefinitely? Let's get to the bottom line. Nothing has changed, at least on the surface, in blanket U.S. support for Israel since October 7th. The U.S. is still supplying Israel with heavy munitions and still blocking just about every attempt to impose international sanctions on Israel at the U.N., as the war in Gaza grinds now into its fourth month, with tens of thousands of Palestinians killed or maimed, most of them being women and children who are innocents in this conflict. Israeli leaders say this asymmetrical war must go on indefinitely in the aftermath of Hamas' surprise attack last October. And so far, Washington has given counsel, reportedly strong and emphatic counsel, to avoid civilian casualties. But at the same time, President Joe Biden has not demanded a ceasefire, even as malnutrition sets in and millions of people have nowhere to go. Israel's leadership seems to be ignoring most of what they are hearing from the White House. So where's the U.S. strategy for the region heading? Or perhaps better yet, where should it be heading? Today we're talking with Aaron David Miller, who worked on U.S. Middle East policy at the State Department for 25 years. He's now a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And he's also author of The Much Too Promised Land, America's Elusive Search for Arab-Israeli Peace. Aaron, it's great to be with you. To look at a book on the much too promised land and the notion about Arab-Israeli peace may sound like fantasy at this moment. And I just want to start asking you about what looks to me kind of like a quagmire of sorts right now and whether or not you see it the same way and whether you see an off-ramp. Uh, first of all, Steve, thanks for having me. It's great to be here with you. Look, I think Israelis and Palestinians, and let's be clear, you've got um, never in the history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict have we entered a phase of terror and violence, <clears throat> exponential rise of deaths both on October 7 and in the uh, punishing Israeli airstrikes in an effort, in ground campaign, in an effort to uh, eradicate, destroy degrade Hamas. Um, this goes beyond anything Israelis and Palestinians have witnessed. It is in the process of traumatizing both communities. And right now, I think both are in a strategic cul-de-sac. There may be a way out of this, but it's going to leave the prospects for a stable, secure, prosperous Gaza and um, the possibilities of a conflict-ending solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict choosing my words very carefully, a conflict-ending solution. Um, it's going to be a, a, a heavier lift uh, than ever before, and we're farther away from the prospects of creating the kind of environment that is required uh, to negotiate such an outcome. So we're in a long, dark tunnel, and right now it's hard to see uh, a quick or easy way out. Now, you have... Uh been engaged with negotiations between Israel and Palestine for most of your working life, you know, a big, a big portion of it. Um, you, after the Clinton administration term that you served, you were very frustrated with the situation. You said one of the mistakes we've made is that we too often acted as Israel's lawyers in this. In this conflict, we're asking as Israel's munitions supply, its armament supply. Are we too deployed on one side of the equation to have credibility on both? Uh, you know, uh, the question of uh, is is this too much? Is it not enough? Uh, is the uh, uh, right, do we, have we struck the right balance? Uh, the reality is, given uh, where we were on October 6th, given the president's persona, he alone among modern American presidents has this deep and abiding commitment, uh, certainly not to the Netanyahu government, but to the idea of Israel, the people of Israel, security of Israel. Given the politics in which he's trying to navigate a very difficult line between a Republican Party, frankly, that has emerged as the Israel can do no wrong party, and a Democratic Party that is deeply divided, pressing him not only um, by progressives, but even mainstream Democrats to impose some measure of cost and accountability on Israel, uh, given, given his persona, the politics, and the, the cruel reality, Steve, that Frankly, and the three core issues of this conflict, how to destroy Hamas or degrade it without wreaking injurious havoc on the, on the Palestinians, number one, how to surge humanitarian assistance into a free fire zone, and what to do about the day after and the day after the day after. 
I think the president's leverage, frankly, uh, is undermined to, to some degree by the fact that we don't have any better answers right now uh, than the Israelis do on these three questions. So I think if you had to ask me where I think Joe Biden uh, would have taken U.S. policy in the wake of the terror surge of October 7, I would say we're about where I would predict uh, he would be. There'll be no open breach, in my judgment, with the uh, Netanyahu government. I think the president, uh, frankly, has done some good things. I don't think there'll be a scintilla of assistance into Gaza had it not been for tremendous pressure on the part of the U.S. on the Israelis. I don't think there would have been any hostages released had it not been for the personal intervention of the president. And I think by now, if reports are true that in the first several days in the wake of October 7, the Israelis were, pre were prepared to preempt against Hezbollah in the north, I think by now, without the Biden administration's intercession, we would have had a, we might have had, might have had a regional escalation by now. Has the president veered too far in terms of identifying closely with the Israelis? No. I think if there's any um, course correction, it's the failure of the administration and the president himself to demonstrate the same kind of regard, empathy, and sympathy for the exponential rise of Palestinian deaths and the humanitarian disaster uh, that is now not just looming, that is unfolding in Gaza. Uh, the fact is we could have done a better job lawyering, if you want to use, and that's Kissinger's conceit, by the way, Israel's lawyer. I resurrected it for Jim Baker hmm. uh, from Kissinger's memoirs. Baker loved it. And it is absolutely true that in the course of negotiations, certainly at Camp David, and I would count myself among those uh, who I think um, failed to understand that if you were going to try to figure out a way to create a conflict ending solution, you're going to have to take more seriously um, the needs and requirements of, uh, of both sides. And I, I don't think we did that at Camp David. And I think that's a real challenge given the nature of the U.S. Israeli relationship for any administration. Aaron, are you surprised at the divide today in the Democratic Party in the United States that seems to be happening? There seems to be a generational um, apathy for the very strong support for Israel, and this seems to be counting uh, against Joe Biden in terms of popularity at this moment. Um, I think that's largely the case. I think there's a greater diversity in Congress. Uh, and on the Israel issue, look, uh, the reality, Joe Biden, uh, alone among mo a modern presidents, ha has this view of Israel, which developed at a time when Israel was perceived to be not uh, not the Goliath in the relationship, but in many respects, the David. And I think that that conceit has, has been altered. Uh, in large part, it's been altered, in, I think, in many respects, by Israel's success. I mean, the Israelis have a, 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 a per capita income that rivals advanced European countries. They are a nuclear weapons state. They have managed as a consequence of their high-tech hmm. industry to become a, a formidable competitor. The notion that Israel is perceived to be vulnerable, uh, if not weak, that, that conceit, I think, frankly, has vanished. If you add to that the um, increasing rightward drift uh, within the Israeli body politic, and there's no question that it's happening. Um, and it's still early days. If by April, May, June, pictures in Gaza begin to change, the Israelis conclude the most kinetic part of their ground campaign, they stay away from airstrikes and artillery and focus on a more brigade-driven uh, set of operations designed to uh, deal with tunnels and the senior Hamas leaders, uh, and if humanitarian assistance can be surged into Gaza, maybe then um, you'll get a, you'll get a break in this, and, and the president m may well be spe uh, spared some of the mo more difficult um, uh, and, and contentious politics, which, which have clearly been stirred up by this conflict. Um, maybe that's how this will that that's the way this will go. But right now. Uh, I think the administration has a not just a hope, but has an expectation uh, that the Israelis, by the end of January or early February, 
will have concluded the most kinetic phase of their ground campaign, and you won't see the kinds of exponential rise in in Palestinian deaths and the destruction that we've watched. We're now in the fourth month of this war. Which is still quite a bit of running room for, for deaths as you sort of talk about, you know, sort of exhausting both targets, exhausting the system, but none that, but between now and that point you just discussed, there still could be a lot of carnage. And I've haven't seen stuff like this where we've seen letters by employees of the White House or the State Department percolating out, being read. Um, there's one of staff members of the Biden 2024 campaign writing an anonymous letter saying, your administration's response to Israel's indiscriminate bombing in Gaza has been fundamentally antithetical to the values of justice, empathy, and the dignity of human life, and we believe it could cost you the 2024 election. I think what, what we're seeing is a fracturing of views within, uh, within an establishment underneath him. Have you seen anything like this? You know the field well. How divided is it and paralyzed, if you will? Never in my 25 years have I seen the degree of inner turmoil and crisis of conscience that exists among staff at the Department of State, the White House and National Security Council, uh, and among congressional staff. Does Palestine now matter in such a way in the region that it can't be ignored again? Or are Arab states really just biding their time and waiting for this to go away? On the Arab side, I think they have no choice but to up the ante as to what normalization, for example, between Israel and the Saudis would cost. Uh, it will have to be tethered. Uh, the, the expression or the formulation that... Um, Tony, Secretary Blinken used in, in Saudi was to provide a practical pathway to a Palestinian state. Now, that, that could be read in many, many different ways and create many different options. But at the same time, I would simply call your attention to the other stunning development. Not a single Arab state, not Israel's treaty partners in Jordan or Egypt, or any of the signatories to the Abraham Accords, the Moroccans, the Bahrainis, the Emiratis, uh, and a potential joiner, Saudis, have chosen to freeze and or break relations with the state of Israel. I find that, frankly, stunning. The silence, frankly, conveyed through that unwillingness to break, in many respects, is definite. And I think what it demonstrates is however strong their publics are in terms of their public their public's anger and hostility toward Israel, particularly in authoritarian societies like Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, and the Emirates, you're not going to have a lot of dissent, maybe a little in Bahrain. But the regimes want to preserve their relations with the Israelis and, by implication, with the United States. And the fact is, maybe... We may well be at a point in which there's the right balance between Arab state commitment to furthering relations with Israel on one hand, but at the same time, using that commitment as leverage to identify a pathway to what in time, in time could be still, I believe in it still, because to abandon it, frankly, is to basically give in dis to despair and hopelessness and to the forces of history who, if they could speak to us, Steve, on the program, would say, don't waste your time on this issue. Israelis and Palestinians will never, ever be able to live alongside one another in peace and security. I I'm not, I do not want to, I have two kids in their 40s, I'm not going to surrender or mortgage the future to that sort of pessimism. No. Forget the forces of history. Let's listen to what they have to say, but let's focus on the forces of diplomacy, which is why even at this moment in this dark tunnel that we're in, I still believe under the right leadership in Washington and on the Israeli and Palestinian side, there may well in time be a way to fashion the parade of horrors that we witness into something better and perhaps a pathway um, to, some, to a better future for Israelis and Palestinians. What you just said is 
quite remarkable, um, Aaron. I had not thought of it that way before in terms of the Arab governments in the region willing, essentially, to tolerate and acquiesce to a lot of horror to keep other equities in place with their relationship with Israel. And the argument is basically many of the civilians, the women and the children who are dying, are expendable in that equation. And it raises this really interesting question, which I have been getting at and thinking about for decades, as you know, looking at groups that are non-state actors, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, looking at Hamas uh, in, in, in Palestine, the Houthis uh, in Yemen, that look so attractive to populations because they seem more legitimately somehow uh, directed at the people while their governments are saying, ah, oh, those Palestinian civilians are, are not important in the equation. Am I getting something wrong there? No, I mean, I think that uh, although Hamas's popularity, it's fascinating. Hamas's popularity in the West Bank, according to the, the polls that Khalil Shikaki has done relatively recently, is tripled. And yet support for Hamas, for their management of the economy, and for the destruction that they've wrought has, has diminished. And, and that obviously sh say basically says to you and me, Steve, where you stand in life has a lot to do with where you sit. Mm. And while the position of West Banker Palestinians is no 260 plus have been killed uh, since October 7, it's hardly um, ideal, to say the least. Situation for 2.3 million Palestinians in Gaza, half of whom under the age of 15, and now 1.8 million um, sandwiched in an area roughly a fifth the size, twice the size of the District of Columbia, a fifth of that, uh, is horrible. I, I think Hamas's prestige, clearly, and their future has been diminished. But there's no doubt that the Houthis, Hezbollah, the so-called axis of resistance um, supported by Iran, uh, plays, particularly among a younger generation, which is why I think it's critically important that we figure out a way to create an alternative pathway. Because this is, at, at almost 75 years old, I have to say, this is a problem, a generational problem. This cannot be measured simply in terms of how I measured my life in administration time in four or eight, eight eight-year increments. This is going to require time. But above all, if we're ever going to get out of this strategic and bloody cul-de-sac that we've been in for decades, it's going to require leaders, leaders who are masters of their political constituencies and of their ideologies, not prisoners of them, leaders who are willing to look at the past, understanding what it takes to bring their respective constituencies along, but are willing to also look to, look to the future. And it's no con coincidence that breakthroughs in this conflict have coincided with periods in which we had those leaders, Begin and Sadat, Rabin and King Hussein, even Yasser Arafat, and Rabin in, in his first incarnation in the early Oslo years. That's what we need. And that's, frankly, right now, uh, what we lack. And we also are going to need leadership in Washington. That's difficult, given the nature of the U.S.-Israeli relationship. Uh, it's a special relationship. Uh, and when we manage it correctly, when the special relationship does not become exclusive, unfortunately, that's happened far too often, we can actually use that relationship to create better outcomes, uh, not just for the Israelis, uh, but for their Arab and Palestinian partners. And I think that's what we need to think through generationally as we watch um, we watch this conflict unfold. But make no doubt, we are facing in this November probably one of the most consequential elections uh, in in American history. and I, and and I, I I fully believe, I do believe, that, uh, again, I voted for Republicans and Democrats. I worked for Republicans and Democrats. Uh, it is critically important, forgive the editorial comment, that um, this administration uh, get a second term. Let me ask you, finally, for a bit of advice for university presidents, for people who are out there 
trying to comment and talk and navigate what has become one of the most costly conversations to some careers that you can imagine. I've been very taken with what something Bernie Steinberg, who was the executive director of the Hillel Group in Harvard from 1993 to 2010, wrote in Harvard's paper, uh, in which he said, it is not anti-Semitic to demand justice for all Palestinians living in their ancestral land. Smearing one's opponents is rarely a tactic employed by those confident that justice is on their side. What is not happening from your perspective in America's university establishment that they might be able to talk about the victims on the Israeli side, the victims on the Palestinian side, and how to navigate a course that's better? What do you see going on there, and what would you advise them? It requires an enormous amount of inner strength, I think. And you have to separate yourself very often uh, from the majority in order to educate yourself on the tragedies, the sensibilities, the sensitivities, the historical woundings that have occurred to both sides. It's hard to do that. And it's harder to then assert the fact that this is Goethe's definition, uh, maybe, of a, of, a, of, a, of a tragedy. Two, two legitimate narratives that somehow cannot find a way uh, to reconcile, uh, and yet they must. So I, I, I'm not sure I have any unsolicited, uh, unsolicited advice other than to detach yourself from the narrow, the narrow anger, uh, and those who have any any number of agendas uh, that they want to follow through on, and think this through for yourself. Mm. Imagine imagine the Israeli-Palestinian problem as an unassembled jigsaw puzzle, puzzle on your living room floor. Right. Read as widely as you can. Talk to people outside of, of your immediate circle and, your, and move outside of your comfort zone. I think that's the only way. And um, I, I'm not terribly hopeful and optimistic in this environment that that's going to be so easy, uh, given the anger uh, and hostility that um, this conflict has generated. Well, I have always known you to be candid, and you are candid today. Aaron David Miller, former U.S. mediator for Arab-Israeli negotiations, now a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment. Thanks so much for joining us today. Steve, it's a pleasure, and thanks for having me. So what's the bottom line? In the centers of power in the U.S. and Europe, the collective West, no one is willing to think that there's an alternative path to the flattening and the gutting of Palestinian lives and land. In fact, they're still arguing that it's vital. If that weren't the case, Israel would be acting differently. Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has personal reasons, other than military ones, to stretch out this war. Plus, he knows that President Biden's first term is going to end this year. And nobody knows if he's still going to be president after that. And there are no other parties other than the U.S. who have real influence in the world and are willing to use it. So what does Washington go and do with that influence? Ask Israel not to kill innocent people with the weapons it keeps supplying to keep this war running? This is a crazy equation. One where we're gonna look back ashamed of what we all let go on for way too long. And that's the bottom line.